B2B marketers, we're back to B2B Beacon's Leaders in Luminary series. I am your host, Thad Kalo, CEO of Business Online and Executive Editor of B2B Beacon. Here we are again in the lovely, windy city of Chicago, home to fantastic T-Bones, deep dish, deep dish pizza, and not only that, the BMA, the B2B's largest marketing association and event in the world. And speaking of large and B2B, we are here today with Russ Glass. Russ is the head of product marketing for LinkedIn's marketing solutions. Russ, thanks for joining us today. Always a pleasure, Ben. Fantastic. Well, you, set, you, 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 you slowed for a second there. You slowed it down. Is, it, is this a true pleasure in your mind? Yeah, I was just thinking, like, is this, is this like awesome? And then I was like, no, it's just a pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, we're going to have a good time today. So Russ, do me a favor. I'd, I'd love for you to do two things. Number one is get us caught up on the, you know, the Bizzo uh, LinkedIn, LinkedIn acquisition. By the way, congratulations. It sounds like it was a, a really great marriage. And in our mind's eye, uh, sitting where we sit, it, it has brought a huge opportunity for B2B marketers out there uh, in a big way. And really what's on the forefront of you know, being a head of product at, at a, you know, an incredible organization with amazing data like LinkedIn and what you guys are, are tackling today, if that's fair. Sounds awesome. All right. That was awesome. Good. Not just a pleasure. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I mean, from the acquisition standpoint, we feel very lucky. You know, we we set out to build the world's best B two B marketing platform, and LinkedIn recognized that what we had built is actually something very special and very unique, and it was an asset that if you combine what we built with the global platform, three hundred and sixty four million. Uh, members that LinkedIn has across the globe, you end up with something very special. And so, you know, that was done in August of last year, 2014, and now it's, it's May of uh, 2015, and we fully integrated those two stacks, right? So now Bizzo products are part of the LinkedIn Marketing Solutions suite, and I think we're creating a whole next generation of products for B2B marketers to help them more effectively reach their prospects, their customers with relevant information at the right time, help those, help guide the experiences that those customers are having and ensure that they're not just um, allowing those customers to kind of go down the, the, the random walk around the web to find the information they need, but they're guiding them and they're providing value to them and they're actually informing them. That's really what we want to try to create for those. Let, and let me ask you a question to that, Russ. And you mentioned the word, you mentioned the word special and I'm going to hone in on it because I, I do think it's special. And in, in, in our world, the way, you know, an over simplified version of this is, is really the, the, the richness of the first party data that LinkedIn has. It's world class. It's, it's the best in the world from a B2B perspective. And then the reach that, that Bizzo brought to that. So you're, you're bringing this incredibly rich data set around who you're targeting and then being able to target them anywhere, whether they're on LinkedIn or anywhere on the web, to get the right message in front of the right person at the right time. And it's that piece that is, has been so lacking in B2B that I think is so, so special in this, in this arrangement. Yeah, you know, we, we looked at marketing automation and saw how successful it had been for B2B marketers and the ability to actually create these nurture flows and, and really create relevant experiences for users. Amazing results, but, but it's very small scale. Yep. And we saw the, you know, half the world's professionals that LinkedIn has, all of the reach and targeting capabilities that Bizzo has. And when you combine those two things, you actually can create marketing automation like relevance and marketing automation like scale, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, personalization and experiences, but at this massive scale, right? Yep. Global, reach all of the right people in, in the business professional context that you're wanting to. And that's a very differentiated experience today, right? Take combining these, the, the power of relevance with the, the power of scale. Do me a favor and, and help me demystify for, for those folks listening today uh, around this notion of marketing automation. Because I think there's a misconception in, in the world. And I, I speak to a good number of B2B marketers all the way from folks just, just starting to CMOs. And, and most think of it as a technology and platform for, for pushing email, right? And I think the way you're looking at it is, is a much larger strategic opportunity that, than most can see. Can you, can you press on that a bit? So it's a good question. I mean, marketing automation today is sort of largely email-based, sure. right? It is um, a very smart way to incorporate behaviors. So what are 
what are your prospects doing, what are your customers doing, and then send them mostly emails that are associated with those behaviors, right? So if somebody downloads this white paper, the next email you should send them is a follow-up to that white paper, right? If somebody views this video, the next thing that you should send them is something that follows up with that video. When we looked at that, we, we sort of had an aha moment because the, the results of actually being intelligent and actually understanding what somebody wants based on their behavior. So I'm ready for that next piece of content or I'm raising my hand, I'm ready to talk to a salesperson based on my behaviors is an incredibly effective way to listen to your customer and then turn around and provide them something relevant. Again, the problem is it doesn't scale yep. because you have to know their email address. You have to already have a dialogue with that user. We're trying to take that to a whole nother place given the you know, 360 plus million people that LinkedIn understands, we have their data and ability to reach them. When you combine that with behavior, so what are they doing on a marketer's website? What content are they consuming? Where in the funnel are they? And you, you, you know, bring those two things together, now you can do marketing automation at a whole new scale where you can reach those users across the web with social media. You can reach them with display advertising. You can reach them on their mobile devices all in these highly relevant contexts. That's, that's game changing, right? In an ideal world, that's how everybody would experience marketing, yep. with content that's relevant versus being sort of salesy. And, and the way you're unlocking that is, is really through the lens of personalized retargeting at, at the cookie level. That's, that's basically what is enabling you to, to market at, deliver marketing automation at scale beyond the inbox. Yeah, I mean, all the way down really to the member level, right? So yep. because LinkedIn has all of these members, and because we know when those members are logged in, we know it's the same member across different devices, we're able to, in a very privacy sensitive way, take that and apply it to all of the data a marketer has. So what are these users doing on my website? We can turn around and provide analytics based on what users are doing on their websites. We can take that behavioral information and create the right experiences by orchestrating messages all the way down that funnel, depending on where they are, depending on what products they care about, in order to, you know, for the marketer, drive better results, for the customer, the prospect, create more relevant experiences. Yeah. And I have to be careful not to gush on LinkedIn too much, but there's some really interesting gush, things. Gush, yeah, no, gush no, away. No, no, this is not, it can't be a commercial. This has to be about education, but I think these are some of the big things that many B2B marketers are struggling with, and one of which you just articulated is you know, cross-device tracking. You know, if you're gonna actually be relevant, you have to know the individual at the desktop level and at the mobile level, and if you don't, there's a disconnect, right? Because you're, you're going to duplicate, you're going to deliver waste you know, in terms of media spend, you name it. And because of the logged in experience, you, you have that ability where most, I mean, even dare I say Google, doesn't. Yeah, no, the, the, the advantages that LinkedIn has in its products and, and what it can do with and for marketers by having logged in users is, is pretty immense, right? The ability to Huge. know somebody's on a mobile device, the same person that was on the desktop, to know that the, where they are in that buying process regardless of what channel they're coming in from, it's really important to, be, to create the right personal experience, right? To, to really understand where they are and what they're doing. And, and when you think about, I mean, our, our goal is to be the most effective platform for marketers to reach professionals, right? So that means at the top of the funnel, we want products that are purpose built for building awareness and creating uh, the right association, brand association for those users. At the mid funnel, we want the right products like our sponsored content products and our sponsored email product for engagement, right? Yep. So how do you really start to engage these users with content and move them through the funnel? And then Lead Accelerator is obviously this, this very powerful bottom funnel platform that captures all of this information, whether it be from a marketer's DMP or a marketer's website, a marketer's CRM system, integrations with Marketo and Eloqua for, for bringing the email data in and then using all of that along with LinkedIn data to put the right message in the right user's hands at the right time for conversion. And, and when you tie all that together, as a marketer, you're really now starting to create these personal experiences, these yeah. highly relevant experiences. To me, that's what effective marketing yeah. is all about. A high level of customer centricity from, from the first instance of the first touch yeah. all the way through. Yeah. Exactly, you're listening, right? You're actually now paying attention to what the user wants 
versus just shooting the same message out over and over again, regardless of where they are in that process. Okay, and let's work our way down that funnel. We like to talk about it as the company buying journey, but we can use the funnel. Buying now. journey. It still works. Sure. It still works. It still works. So, um, I think one of the big things that folks struggle with is, is as you compare, and we'll, we'll just talk about it from, from a channel perspective at the display level, if you will. If you compare a display to search, you know, you're talking about interest versus intent. A lot of folks line up those metrics are using first or last click attribution and they're saying, you know, search crushes it and that's why Google is what it is today. I think, you know, there's a rise of understanding that, you know, first of all, there is that the economy of, of search is, is, is having a, a tougher time than it has in the past, so I'll put it that way. But how, what, would, what advice would you give those marketers to, to better understand the influence that display is having throughout the journey you know, versus their traditional way of looking at you know, the success metrics that are displayed to some level of attribution? Yeah, so I think display is obviously a hugely scaled platform, right? That's first and foremost. There's, there's nothing else like it in terms of being able to really create reach and frequency online. The, the downside to display is it's not really a bottom funnel format, right? It's not something that's going to drive a whole bunch of leads because people, there's a combination of things like ad blindness, right? It takes a lot of impressions in order to really kind of help a message sink in. Um, it, the, the context you put it in is really important. And ultimately, right, there's a whole bunch of fraud, right? So there's a lot of impressions out there that just aren't being served to who you think they're being served to. So all of those things together mean to me that display is something that really isn't going to be uh, the, the bottom funnel solution for most marketers. It, it isn't, but a lot of folks are being measured against the bottom funnel metrics. And so totally. there's a disconnect between you need my leads, qualified leads, sales qualified leads to, hey, what is this display campaign doing for me today? Total right. disconnect, right? Total disconnect. What's happening though, is I think increasingly marketers are realizing that, hey, it's actually a really effective top funnel mechanism. And if you measure it the right way, and you measure things like you know, brand lift, you measure things like how are people engaging after having seen seven, eight, nine of these impressions? Or how often are they visiting my websites? How, how many page views are they consuming? What are the likelihood to convert for, for having seen these display ads? Like all of those are really effective um, ways to measure the effect of display on your brand efforts. When you start to get below that and do, to engagement, where you're really trying to educate them, you're really trying to put the right content in front of them, you're trying to help them understand why you're so valuable, display is less effective. Right? Sure. It, that, that gets into some of these more native formats, it gets into really being able to, to uh, ensure someone's reading what you're putting in front of them. Uh, and so, you know, I think it's just a matter of aligning measurement with goal, right? What are you really trying to accomplish with this effort, and how are you measuring? You shouldn't be measuring display with leads, right? It just, that's like, you know, trying to measure a leadoff hitter in baseball uh, with runs batted. Yeah, yeah, home runs, yep. Right? Yeah. It, it just doesn't make sense. Um, I, you know, the, the, one of the examples I give that help people sort of grok the difference, right, and why this is so important in the B2B world is, you know, if you're in the consumer world, and let's say that you, you go into a store because you're really thirsty, right, and you see Coca-Cola and DMG Cola, right, you go right for the Coca-Cola because you know the brand, you know the experience you're going to get, and you've never heard of this, this other one, right. Well, let's say earlier that day you saw a display ad that said DMG Cola tastes like Coke but entirely organic. Right? That is a branding ad. It's not trying to drive you to any conversion, but it's trying to change your mindset so that the next time you're going to make a decision, you might think differently. So now you walk into the store having seen that ad and you see DMG Cola, Coke, you say, oh, DMG Cola, you know, tastes like Coke, entirely organic, I'll give it a shot. Right? So that's a successful branding experience for a consumer marketer. Think about B2B now, right? So let's say in the B2B context, your boss comes to you and says, Dad, I want you to throw a party. And I know you don't have a boss, but let's pretend it's your wife, right? So <laughs> she yeah. is the boss. Yeah. Let me tell you yeah. that. Right? <laughs> She's the <laughs> ultimate boss. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So board comes to you and says, hey, Thad, I want you to throw a party, and I want you to buy the soda for the party, right? Now you walk into the store, and you see DMG Cola, and you see Coca-Cola, 
even if you had seen that branding ad that said DMG Cola tastes like coconut entirely organic, what do you buy? You know, I, I think I might go with DMG. Okay, so that's because you're like the CEO. Yeah. 99% of people out there, <laughs> I like to challenge it, are going to buy the Coke. Sure. And they're going to buy the Coke because it's a risky decision to show up to a party with this unknown brand of soda. Like all the other people See, at the I party. I like to be on the cutting edge, Rush. I like to push. Yeah, no, I know that about you. Rush. I know that about you. <laughs> but what if you're on the party? Right. Because the soda stinks, and all fair, these people who never saw yeah. that branding, right, never had that experience that you had, now you know, walk away saying this party stunk because of this soda. Simple, simple example. That no, makes sense. This is how people are making decisions in B2B every day. They are thinking of it as a risk mitigation. How do I make sure that I don't choose the wrong product or service for my company? Because it's about more than just me and it's career limiting if I choose the wrong product or service. So as a B2B company, what do you have to do, right? You've got to, you've got to create case studies where somebody who chose DMG Cola, the people that went to that party, you know, rated it higher than the party with the Coke, right? Sure. You have to create references with people that you trust who say, oh, I tried throwing a party with DMG Cola, it was awesome, right? I mean, this is what B2B marketing is all about, but you have to be very consistent about putting the right messages at the right point in that funnel. Because if this person is, is getting the wrong message at the wrong part of the funnel, you, there's just no chance, right? right. And it's, a, it's aligning those objectives of a campaign with specific measurement that is connected to what, what should be measured at, at that level. That's exactly right. And let me ask you this. In, in, you know, so I think there, there's that layer of measurement, right? It's understanding, okay, you know, we're talking about awareness display and we should be measuring you know, the effective awareness display against awareness display metrics, right? Not leads. But if we look at the rise of the modern day marketer, shouldn't we at some point understand and connect that influence all the way through to a purchase so we can actually look back at some point in time, even if we have a sales cycle that's 12 or 16 months and say, hey look, I know these folks from this company interacted with DMG ads 19 different times and they actually ended up buying three cases and, and therefore we should give ourselves credit for having done that upper awareness you know, campaign? Absolutely, I mean, and, and we're seeing that, right? We're seeing this, this, the rise of attribution, right? The ability to actually start to understand how upper funnel tactics and mid funnel tactics are affecting the overall, not only the, the close of the sale, but actually lifetime value yeah. of the customer, right? Um, how, what usage of the product did they have tied all the way back to how do you actually, you know, reach that person? And then you take that to the next level and there's all kinds of predictive models that are being created based on, okay, we see this conversion flow, we see the lifetime value of this customer being high. How do we use all of that data to predict who else we should be targeting out there so that we're not wasting money on brands that either aren't ever going to convert, you know, customers that aren't going to convert, or customers that will just be poor customers yep. and high cost customers for us to service. Right? This is all part of that efficiency play. How do you, how do you continue to use data to improve the quality of your marketing? I love it. I love it. Let's let's move down to the to more middle middle funnel type opportunities. What you know from a um, product standpoint, what what is LinkedIn put in front of us? What works? Yeah. And why? So so we have two core products in the mid funnel. One is our sponsored updates product. Yep. And two is our sponsored in mail product. Sponsored updates is the fastest growing product in LinkedIn history. It's going to be about fifty percent of our uh, marketing solutions business this year, and. It's growing as You really made your impact on LinkedIn. It's been, in yeah, I, 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 walk in, I walk in and all of a sudden this thing takes off. Uh, no, I wish I could take credit for this product. This was a very um, well thought through and conceived product before I got there. Um, I'm stewarding it now. And, but. And, and, and for the layman, just so you, just to make an analogy, it's very similar to, this, to the sponsor ads you would have on Facebook, right? But it's now more focused around, contextually around your your communities that you're involved in, what you are, are, are yeah. reading, what you're not reading. And so, you know, from a business perspective, it's, it's an incredibly relevant source of, of information. That's right, these are news feed ads, yep. right? So you have the, the LinkedIn feed. It's all about, it's the experience on LinkedIn that keeps you up to date with what's going on in your network, keeps you up to date with what's going on with companies you follow, right? Keeps you up to date with your professional life. Yep. These are the sponsored 
updates within that feed. So it's promoted content that you like see on a Twitter, it's sponsored content that you see on a Facebook. The power of these things though is that you're hitting your prospects and customers in a highly targeted way and when they're highly engaged consuming content, yep. right? They're basically opted in to the consumption of content. So as a marketer, your ability to put highly relevant, highly valuable content in front of those users is a powerful way to engage them. So I'm interested to understand the inside baseball behind how you balance the relevancy of what needs to be in those news, those news feeds, yep. the sponsored updates, and, and dollars, right, and, and, and advertising dollars. What, is that, what does that conversation look like in LinkedIn these days? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, we have to think members first, right? We have to think, create a relevant experience for members, because if we don't create a relevant experience, there is no feed. Yeah. And, you know, if there's no feed, there's no place for us to put sponsored content. So, first comes relevance and, and members and their experience. And then second comes, how do we you know, get our marketers in front of them with the most relevant experience in a promoted context, in a, in a sponsored context? And we've, I think we've done a very good job balancing that. I mean, you, know, you can see it just in the, the fact that the business has grown so fast at the same time that engagement has grown on our feed as fast as it's grown. So, so we've done a pretty good job balancing it. And I think that'll continue into the future, right? That sort of balance between making sure that it's a, it's a conversation, it's a highly engaged feed, it's not a NASCAR kind of a sponsorship model, right, where you have ads everywhere, but you're placing them when they're highly relevant and, and um, the experience is good for the member. Interestingly, right, a lot of our sponsored updates have higher engagement than our organic content. Interesting. Which means that marketers are doing a really good job targeting those users and putting relevant content in front of them because users are voting with, with their clicks. Sure. And, and in terms of those votes and those that are being most successful, are they typically sharing thought leadership type content? Are they, t are they sharing more you know, bottom funnel type content around you know, specs and feeds? Like what's actually winning in those feeds? A lot, a lot of both. Okay. Um, the more aligned you can be with that content to where that user is in their funnel, the higher the engagement's gonna be. The more that you can create uh, experiences that are fresh and relevant and good, valuable thought leadership and content, the higher engagement's gonna be. The more helpful you can be, the higher the engagement's gonna be. Sure. Yeah, you gotta give first, reciprocity first. You gotta give. Absolutely. Absolutely. Moving down to the bottom of the funnel, I know Lead Accelerator is the, is the big opportunity for you right yeah. now. Where, well, where are we today? What is that gonna look like in you know, six or nine months from now? Before we go there, I just wanna talk about yeah. sponsored in-mail briefly. Right? Okay. So sponsored in-mail is LinkedIn's email product, right? The difference between in-mail and your typical inbox is that there, there is no sort of other spam in these inboxes, right? There is um, only one message every 60 days can be delivered to members, and so it's a really highly engaged format. And it's 100% deliverability. You know, that's an, so both of those stats are interesting. Number one is once every 60 days. So why once every 60 days? That's an amazing length of time to, 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 push, to push someone back. Experience. We just don't want to flood the user's inbox with these messages. They're persistent. They're in the inbox until somebody decides that they want to either delete it or respond to it. 100% deliverability. So we wait until somebody's engaged on LinkedIn to actually deliver the message to them. Yeah, that's smart. When you combine all that, the, the results are unbelievable, right? The open rates are 50%. Right, click-through rates are twenty percent. Right, these amazing stats, um, but we don't want to overburden the member with these messages, which is why we limit that frequency. Yep. So, uh, just another very powerful vehicle for mid funnel. Then there's Lead Accelerator uh, at the bottom of the funnel, and Lead Accelerator is a product, and it's really LinkedIn's first product that takes data from the marketer. So we look at website data, retargeting data. We can look at CRM data. We look at marketing automation data to help determine where a user is in the buying process. We take all that behavior, what products are they looking at, how deep are they into those products, how are they engaged with content, and we use that along with the LinkedIn profile data in order to orchestrate the right messages to those users. So the right product messages, the right funnel messages, or the right journey messages, yep. the right messages based on the title of the 
of the person, the company and industry they work for, all of that is now intelligent, right? So that you can create these really relevant experiences, increase velocity, increase relevance to the, the buyer and ultimately convert them. I love it. So you're obviously using the marketer's data or the data they own against their customer base with, with your product set. And you mentioned the CRM data, the marketing automation data, web analytics data. In a perfect world, we all have our act together. We've been working with folks who have data skills. How good does that data have to be for it actually to, to work with, with the LinkedIn Accelerator? I mean, even if you have no marketing automation data, no CRM data, we can take your website visitors and use that data highly effectively with ours okay. to drive results. Right? So Ideally, you've already been thinking about nurturing and you've already been creating good experiences for that small subset of people that you know. Yep. And we just expand, blow that up, right? expand that significantly so that you can now reach them with those same orchestrated experiences on social or mobile on display, you know, across the adjustable sort of universe. Okay. And if you're you know if you're bubbling yourself up at the you know 10, 30,000 foot view as a marketing leader, you, you, you own a brand, you you are in charge with you know demand generation and, and producing revenue, what are the key metrics you look at? Because I think there is there's data fatigue, I think there's issues with you know uh, dashboards and reports. And at the end of the day, I don't necessarily know that a lot of us are looking at the right information to make decisions to grow our business. So sitting in that, in that role, what advice would you give in terms of those, the key metrics that actually move your business forward? You know, I mean, the advice I give all marketers is revenue. Measure to revenue. If you can't measure revenue, get as close to revenue as you can. And the reason is people don't understand, right? Hey, other than marketers, other than sort of inside baseball, People don't understand clicks, click-through rate, engagement, page views. People don't really care, yep. right? But when you talk in revenue terms, when you talk about instead of, hey, we drove engagement up by 10% this month, right? When you convert that into, you know, the downstream $20,000 in additional revenue you drove because of that 10%, that's what the rest of the company cares about. And that's what's going to get the CEO engaged, the CFO engaged, the the CIO engage because that's how everybody thinks about the business. So for most of us who don't have closed loop marketing knowing every dollar that goes in and how it's producing revenue, you're talking about forecasting. So if you only can produce up to the lead or marketing qualified lead, you're saying then your close rate or your, you know, your conversion rate from marketing qualified to sales qualified is X, sales qualified to yeah. close is X, average lifetime value is Y. And with that, we're going to have an extrapolation or forecast against the, re the estimated revenue we impact. That's exactly right. I would rather see a marketer come to me with, you know, the changes we made this month led to a tw an estimated $20,000 in revenue gain, plus or minus, right, $2,000 plus or minus or whatever, then come to me with a whole bunch of click and engagement data. <laughs> Got it. And it, it's, it's so easy to get bogged down by that because it's so trackable, but you're right. How do you bubble it up to, to meaningful business? It, it has so. to, you have to talk in the language people understand. And I think a lot of marketers have struggled with that historically that, you know, they come with this hard and fast data that nobody cares about. Yep. Right. Instead of just good, smart estimates on what everybody cares about. Yep. I love it. I love it. Um, you know, when you think about push, putting LinkedIn aside for a second, um, what are the big disruptors that are coming our way that we're, we're not necessarily aware of right now, sitting in the, in the seat that, that, that you're seeing? So yeah, I mean, I'm gonna talk about some of this today, but I think uh, mobile continues to be a massive disruption in the, uh, in the industry. You know, LinkedIn now, over half of our users are consuming LinkedIn for mobile devices. We're seeing B2B trends that information is being consumed by professionals more than half the time on mobile and yet I still see emails that you can't actually interact with and read on a mobile device. I see landing pages that you can't actually fill in on a mobile device, right? So all of that I think is still a big set of opportunities for B2B to, to focus on. How do, we, how do we basically interact with the half of our users that we are not effectively interacting with today? That's a big one. Uh, I think predictive and predictive analytics are a big one, right? So the, the, the cost of, of processing has declined so fast. The cost of storage has declined so fast that now we can actually store everything 
process everything and get insights where we couldn't get insights before, yep. right? Um, so actually surfacing, what are the attributes of our buyers, right? Are they hiring or have they just gone to a new office space? All these different sort of things you wouldn't even think about to predict who else should we be targeting out there to drive more high lifetime value customers, right? That's a big and I think growing field. Um, this notion of ad tech meets marketing tech is really important, right? Marketing tech to date has been very low scale, right? Kind of dealing in the tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands. Ad tech uh, has been massive scale, dealing in the billions, right? In tens of billions. But marketing tech is creating great personal relevant experiences, whereas ad tech basically was creating poor scale of experience. Yep. The merging of those two is a huge opportunity, right? Creating these, these highly relevant one-to-one -one experiences at scale has been a promise since the invention of the internet. <laughs> but I think it's actually starting to happen. Internet of Things, you know, I just read an article today that, that Johnny Walker uh, has put uh, sensors so that they know when you've opened your bottle, right? So they can shift from purchase marketing to now consumption marketing. Right. Think about it. every single product on the planet has that bottle opening and bottle out moment. How does that start to affect marketing? And let me ask you a question. I love that one because if you think about from a marketing perspective, you know, collecting the, the data that we should be owning and, and, and really managing well, web analytics data, marketing automation data, CRM data, um, you know, how do you bring that together to understand the, the, the journey your customers take? I think most of us would agree that we're, we're just early in that journey. But then you, 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 you add on this Internet of Things thing, right? And, and the amount of data that's going to be coming there. Number one is, are, are we prepared for it? And number two is, what is the role of the marketer in, in that data set? Yeah, you know, it's easy to be overwhelmed by it. But if you are already thinking about creating relevant experiences, and you're, you're already thinking about how do you use data in order to improve the customer journey, then Internet of Things is just more data in, in different channels. So we can feel better about ourselves. Now. Yeah, okay. but it's, it's the same Thank concept. That, yeah, anytime, I'm just trying to make this easy on you. Um, it's the same concept, right? It's the same set of concepts. It's, it's being, being able to listen to your customer, having the right systems in place to listen to what's going on and how they're consuming and all that good stuff where they are on the journey, and then having systems to react to that. <clears throat> and it shouldn't matter if those data streams get faster or there are different channels, if you've got the right processes and mindset set up. The companies that don't, right, are going to struggle mightily. Yeah. And would, you, would it be fair to assume that it's, it's the customer centricity approach? If you have that as part of the core fabric of the, of the way you go to market, you think about you know, why you exist, then you, you're going to be in a decent shape to absorb this and make hay with it. If it's about being big and, and procurement and efficiencies, then you may struggle with this this whole you know data driven notion. Focus on the customer, right? Focus on the customer. If you if you are truly thinking about how to create better experiences for the customer, you're going to make good decisions because that'll inform what technologies you need to put in place in order to create those experiences. Okay. Two last questions. One is um, career advice. Give, give these folks some advice around what you know, the modern day marketer should be thinking about as they begin to plan their next two or three steps over the next couple of years, A. And the second part to that question is strategic planning. If you're sitting in the role of, of you know, owning, owning marketing for a particular brand, um, what should be on the roadmap over the next couple of years at that strategic level? So from a career standpoint, you know, I think as a marketer, I would want to um, either be at a culture that's open to customer centricity and, and putting the right things in place to service the customer effectively, the right kind of management team that's open to new insights that are gleaned from all this data, um, and, and have the uh, resolve to actually act against, you know, against that. Uh, if you're not in that kind of environment and you don't think you can change it, I would think I would say it's time to start thinking about a move to organizations that do. If you think you can change it, I think it's a great opportunity to start to execute and start to make investments into changing cultures like that. 
from a, um, what was the second question again? The strategic plan. So what, what should be on someone's strategic plan over the next year that may not already be outside of buying LinkedIn products, which is obvious. You have to buy LinkedIn products. <laughs> And then once you've fully invested in that, <laughs> then you well can done. think about other stuff. Okay. Um, the other stuff, you know, I would be, you know, it's very similar to the career advice in some ways, but I would be thinking about a very simple question, maybe a hard one to answer, but a simple question, right? What is a great experience for my customers? Right. What would be the ideal experience that I'd want to create for my customers? And are you mapping that? Are you putting that in mission statements? Like, what is what is the output of that? We'll start with what is a great experience. Okay. Right. And then that can become, well, you know, I'm not going to get there in a year. So it might be my three-year vision is to create this kind of experiences for my customers, and then I'm going to start to work backwards. What can I accomplish over the next year? towards creating those great experiences for my customers, right? So what is that experience? What value does it drive to the organization if I can create those experiences? What value does it drive to the customer if yep. I can create those experiences? And then work backwards, how do I get to those experiences, right? That, to me, is you know how I think marketers have to start thinking because products and marketing are colliding, right? They, 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 it's all kind of one big uh, package at this point. And if you can along that journey, start to create a very powerful, relevant relationship with that buyer, not only are you going to you know, have more success closing deals and, yep. and, and getting new customers, but those customers are going to be better prepared to become successful and, and become advocates for you yep. in the long run. You, you know what I love about that advice, Russ? I think you know, coming from the tech world and being in this, in this world of you know, technology and data, the advice isn't another piece of technology or you know insight from data. It's it's the advice of simply better understanding the needs of your customers and mapping that so you can serve them throughout. And technology is an enabler in that, but that's a framework. That's a way of thinking as opposed to a particular you know purchase or um, you know event. Well, start with link. We, remember we invested. Oh yeah, yeah LinkedIn. We invested yeah. all the budget in LinkedIn products, <laughs> and then we did. That. I love it, Ross. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thanks for the time. Thanks for having me. Yeah.